We have arrived at our eighth and final episode in this series on the journey, and fittingly, we're talking about how to finish strong. Uh, it's a concept we all understand, but don't always do it well. And there are some things that get in our way. And in this episode, we're gonna unpack exactly what those things are so that the last part of whatever we do will end up being the best. Friends, hello there. Hey, welcome to part eight in our mini series on the journey. This is our final episode. It has been such a wonderful adventure working through all of these ideas about how do we journey well through life. And this final piece to the puzzle is one that has been uh, incredibly near and dear to my heart. I believe it will be for you as well as we just try to understand what does it look like to finish well. And I want to begin with a story from the life of Jesus. And it comes the night before he goes to the cross. Uh, they've left the upper room, wherever that may be, probably back here somewhere. And they're en route to the Kidron Valley to Gethsemane, to go through the Kidron Valley, to go up into Gethsemane. And there's an interesting thing that is recorded in John chapter 17. And in the past when I read this, like it's super compelling. Jesus prays for his current disciples. He prays for all future disciples, you and me in the prayer. But he's got these first five verses that's like an introduction, or at least that's how I've always viewed it. But what I've come to realize in the last several years is that it's not an introduction to the prayers he's going to give. It's this astounding statement about what he has done in his life and what he's going to call his current disciples and all future disciples into as well. And so I just wanna jump right into this here in John 17, verses one and following goes like this. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began." Now, there's a lot we could unpack in those first five verses, but what's so fascinating to me is that in the midst of this and right before he prays for his current disciples and future disciples, he just says this. He says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And what's fascinating about this is he hasn't gone to the cross yet. And so some people look at this and go, okay, well, everything leading up to this moment, Jesus is declaring, like, I finished all that work that you gave me to do. And that's absolutely true. As I read it, I just don't wonder if Jesus isn't additionally saying, knowing that he's going to the cross, like, Father, you can consider it done. Like, I have finished everything that you've asked me to do, and the cross is going to be no different you can consider it done because I am going to finish strong. And I love the fact that Jesus made this statement that John recorded this for us because it's talking about how Jesus did everything God had asked him to do. And it's what drove these final moments of his life was to finish out what he already knew he needed to do. Uh, the Apostle Paul said something similar as well um, at a place called Miletus at the end of his third missionary journey. Uh, the majority of his third missionary journey was actually spent in Ephesus, and Miletus is about 50 miles south of Ephesus, and Paul left Ephesus. He went over to Europe for a bit. He's trying to get up to Jerusalem, but he stops at Miletus to have a conversation with the elders from Ephesus. Paul didn't want to get caught in Ephesus, so he went to Miletus and had the elders sent for. And when they show up, 
he is about to have what he believes is going to be his last conversation with the Ephesian elders. Um, and the place of Miletus is just a, a fabulous place to visit. Uh, here is an artist's rendering of what the city would have looked like in the time of Paul. Uh, today, you have some just fantastic ruins. This is a big, beautiful theater. And when you go up into the theater and you go out to the back, you have this viewpoint into ruins of other parts of the city of Miletus. And I always love taking my groups to this place when we take our turkey study trips. And we open up to Acts chapter 20 and we read Paul's final speech to the Ephesian elders. And notice just part of what he says, but again, connected into what Jesus said right before he went to the cross. He says to the elders, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And whereas Jesus is at the end of his life and he says, Father, I have completed everything that you've asked me to do. Paul's like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen, but here, here's my aim. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task. That Paul is just saying, I want to finish strong. And 10 years ago at Miletus, we're having a conversation around these very words of Paul. And I had a couple on the trip who raised their hands and they just said, hey, we want to share something with you. And they shared something with me that was just absolutely fantastic and so helpful. And I'll share that with you in just a few moments. But let me catch you up on who this couple was because they were a pair of artists and not just like recreational artists, like professional artists. And they did all of these amazing projects literally all around the world. And 10 years ago when they were on the trip, they were like in their early 20s. And now they've got a young family and all of that. And they were a fantastic couple. So much fun. Um, and we were just literally looking at this view when they started to share something from their experience as artists. And they're brilliant. Um, this is Tanner right here. This is Alexis right here. Again, absolutely hilarious couple. <laughs> this just kind of captures one of their artworks and having a little bit of fun with that. But one of the things that they were contracted to do literally around the world was to create these magnificent pieces of art that would be in highly trafficked areas, whether it was in a public square, whether it was in a center part of town, whether it was for a playground like this right here that is called the Dragonfly. Um, this sucker is enormous. It's 54 feet long. It weighs over 100 tons. And the wingspan on this dragonfly goes out 40 feet. And so you've got this kind of netting system on one side and the same on the other side. That's the wings of the dragonfly. And it is a remarkable piece of artwork that's very functional for the community. Really cool way to get up to the dragonfly. Kids on this all the time. Big, beautiful uh, track, if you will, running through the middle of the butterfly. You've got all of these different slides. There's slides on both sides, a big slide going off the back. Just an outstanding piece of artwork. So they like know what they're doing. And they're not only contracted to do works of art like this all around the world, but they're teachers as well. And here's what they said to me on that day. They said, Brad, on the very first day that we have our students in front of us, we share with them a concept that we want to ingrain in them as soon as possible. And the concept is this. They said, it is the last 10% of any project that makes or breaks the project. They said it's the last 10% that matters the most. Because you can do all of this amazing work 
and not finish it out, and the rest of the work is compromised. Um, on the other hand, they said, what's interesting is, is that you may have struggled with the first 90%, not necessarily getting it all right, trial and error in some places, making mistakes, trying to correct it. And they said, if that last 10% is really solid, it will cover a multitude of mistakes that happened in that first 90%. And when they were sharing this with me in connection to the Apostle Paul, they were saying, this is what Paul is after. Like his first 90% was solid, but Paul's focus is, I want to make sure that last 10% is the best it can possibly be because it will impact everything else that went on in his ministry. And as they shared that with me and to the group as a whole, it was like, of course this is the case. Uh, I was recently counseling with uh, an author. Um, I would say counseling because I wasn't charging them, so it wasn't so much consulting. And they were like sharing with me how they've been working on a book for years and years and years. And they were almost to the end. And the sense that I got in the conversation was they just wanted it to be over with. They just wanted to get it out there. And I cautioned them and I said, listen, you have spent years putting this thing together. Make sure that this last 10% is your very best. Make sure the editorial process is fantastic because with the sense that I got is they wanted to kind of cheat the editorial system at the end. And I said, you don't want to do that. Because if all your storylines are not tied up, if you have misspellings, errors in your manuscript when it is published, like people will see that and they'll call the rest of what you have done into question. It will compromise the other work that you have done. Uh, it's true in writing or finishing a project like a book. It's, it's true in sports. For any of you who have ever played sports before and pick a sport, they will always talk about make sure your follow through is strong. So my, my daughter is in volleyball season, just had a game last night. And the last thing a coach wants is that as they're throwing the ball up and getting ready to hit it, is at the last minute start to slow down their swing. They don't want them to slow down. They want them to accelerate through. So how do they talk about that? They say, make sure you have a strong follow through because if you're snapping through it, then you're not going to be decelerating at the point of impact. You will be accelerating in order to send the ball, you know, hopefully into an ace position. Um, it's true in volleyball. It's true in golf. Like the fascinating thing is that in all of these different sports that have a ball and you're striking something is that the follow through always comes after the contact point. And so sometimes it's like, well, why is the follow through so important if it's happening after you've already struck the ball? Like the ball is already gone. It's because the follow through is the indication as to whether or not you hit the ball correctly, whether it's in volleyball or in golf, because if you decelerate at the point of contact with the ball, the ball's going to spray. You're going to, you know, either hook it or you're going to slice it or you're going to nub it or you're going to do something that you don't want to do. And the point is, is that as you're coming to the finish line, as you're coming to that strike point, you want to be accelerating. You want it to be the strongest part of your swing in order for the ball to go where you want it to go. That's exactly what Paul is talking about. It's exactly what Jesus was saying, like, I have done that. Now, we all know about, you know, a, a well-known leader um, who had a major blunder at the end of their career, and it called into question everything else they had done before that. It's sad, it's frustrating, it's heartbreaking, but it's how people view life. It's how people view something when someone goes through that, that it shouldn't compromise everything, and yet it does, because people go, well, if that was true at the end, than what was happening in other places as well. And when Alexis and Tanner were talking about this, this idea of the last 10%, they are just talking about how do we finish strong? That the last 10% of whatever we're called to do is probably the most important percentage of the entire project. 
And sometimes when you start thinking about, okay, finishing strong and we understand this idea of, well, we've got to take this thing across the finish line and we all know what it's like to get tired or exhausted or to kind of limp something across the finish line, is that sometimes we just need help better understanding why we don't finish as well as we ought to. Uh, and for that, I just want to offer just a quick recommendation from a friend of mine. John Acuff has his brilliant book on finish. And it just talks about all the ways in which we can get hung up and ways in which we can push what we're up to through the finish line. And so if that might be something that'd be helpful for you, pick up a copy of Finish. Um, you won't regret it. It's a really, really great book. But as I just continue to consider just these words of Paul, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task, is that he had this idea that he wanted to finish well. And what's so cool is that this where isn't where Paul's story ends. Like we have something from his very last letter that is so incredibly compelling. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 7, he gets to write to his protege, Timothy, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I mean, such compelling words for Paul to be able to say. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Jesus says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And I don't know about you, but I want to be able to say that. I want to be able to get to the point where I can say, I finished strong. Now, I know that even as I say that, though, there's maybe some, some disconnect maybe for you in that when we often talk about finishing strong, we typically think in terms of for those who are later on in life. Um, I've got a friend right now who's in his early 80s, and every single time we talk, he says, Brad, I just want to finish strong. And man, is he finishing strong. Like everything he is doing, like he is on point, he is on par, he is doing exactly what God is asking him to do. And he's so compelling to me watching how well he is finishing. But here's the thing that's fascinating to me is that when Jesus said the words that he said, when he said, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, he's somewhere between 33 and maybe 35 years old. I'm 41 years old. That's a sobering thought for me. It's not just for people who are later on in life. It's about wherever we find ourselves on the journey today that we all know that we're not guaranteed another day, another week, another month, another year. And that as Jesus was able to say in these moments, Father, I finished the work you gave me to do. Like, I want to be able to say that if my life were to end next week or next month, to be able to stand before God and say, I did everything you asked me to do. And it's all around finishing strong in whatever God has given you to do. Maybe for some of you, you're teachers right now, and you're like, I've got two years left. It is so easy to slow down, to decelerate, to just coast through the finish line. And if you do that, your work will suffer. Finish strong. For those of you who are in the middle of a project right now and you're feeling that exhaustion and you're just like, I just want to limp this thing across the finish line, don't slow down. Finish strong. Now, for those of you who are partway through your engagement and you've been able to remain pure and yet you're starting to find that it gets harder and harder as you approach the wedding day, it's so easy to say, well, we're gonna get married anyway. Don't settle for that, finish strong. For those of you who are at the end of your life and you're going, I know I don't have a lot of time left, finish strong. Friends, I believe that as we are on this journey of life and as we're navigating all the things that we talked about in this series, that wherever we find ourselves today, the voice of God is saying, keep going, keep being focused. Whatever I'm giving you to do, finish strong. Because when we have this focus, 
that our last 10% is going to be our best and we finish strong, we will be able to say, Father, I brought you glory here on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So friends, may that be true for us on the journey ahead, that as we continue to navigate life as it comes our way, may we do so in a way that brings glory to God, because if we're bringing glory to God, we are experiencing goodness in our own journey, and that is worth pursuing. So friends, thanks so much for tuning in for this series on the journey. Thank you to those of you who are watching. Thank you to those of you who are listening. And as always, may we walk out the text well in our life.